And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Devin Kramer, who during his near-death experience opened his eyes to what experience is like outside of time and no longer saw the world the same. Duality was becoming an illusion, and thus he started his spiritual journey into the unknown. Devin, thank you for joining me, and welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right, Devin, if you don't mind, let's start on the day that it happened and go from there. Yeah, so it's actually really easy to remember this day. Uh, January 20th, 2016, it was actually Trump's inauguration. Mm. So a lot of chaos going on. Um, And uh, so I had, at the time, I was dealing with kidney stones. I was having rapid kidney stones. I was in and out of the hospital. And I decided I wanted to get off pain meds and actually try to do something natural. So I bought some CBD. Um, And I ended up having an adverse reaction to the CBD very quickly. And what I didn't realize is it had actually caused my body to have a stroke. Um, And so my left brain was actually starting to close down. So I picked up the phone very quickly because I thought I had been poisoned. And so I called 911. Um, I let them know that I had been poisoned uh, and that I needed help. And about that time, I collapsed. And so probably about what I felt like was like five seconds later, um, I was up. I was walking around my apartment. Um, I was looking uh, around at things and the colors were brighter than I'd ever seen, but they weren't painful to my eyes. They were very vibrant, but they did not hurt my eyes. Um, I looked at the TV and time had frozen. There was nothing that was happening on the TV. It was as if it had frozen at that point. Um, And so I noticed instantly that something was not right. Um, And the moment that I noticed something wasn't right was the moment everything was okay. I got flooded with every emotion of unity, of love. My cells felt like they were completely aligned. My body felt like it was aligned. I had zero fear at this point. So I sat down for whatever was going to come next because I did not know. Um, I sat down, called my lab over, my dog, who was my best friend, and I was ready. I was ready for what came next. And at that point in time is when all of a sudden I could hear again and the EMTs were speaking to me, trying to kind of coax me up. And at that point, it took about three hours to convince me that I was not dead. Um, It was, yeah, it was probably, I mean, it was the most intense experience of my life. And it was so quick. Um, There were moments where I felt like I didn't exist. Like my body did not actually exist. And yet I knew I was okay. I knew I was safe. I knew that everything was going to be all right. While you were up walking around and everything was so vibrant and bright, were you outside of your body? I was. There was a point where I looked over and you could see, because it's on around a corner, you could see my body. Um, and so once that happened, I think that was the moment I realized it, it, everything changed at this point, that I was in between someplace I had never been. And then that's when all the flooding of emotion that everything was going to be okay kicked in. At the point when you asked your dog to come next to you, or you called your dog, were you still out of your body? I was. Interesting. And I could also feel my dog. That's the part that's really interesting. Interesting is that your dog could see you. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm assuming the dog responded to you. She did. Yep. She came and sat right next to the chair that I was sitting in. It was a big recliner. Do you recall popping back into your body? I don't recall that. I recall hearing. So it's almost like there was no sound whatsoever throughout this whole experience. And then all of a sudden I started hearing yelling, which was the EMTs at that point. But I don't, I didn't have an experience of physically seeing myself return. I wonder if you were what people call bilocated during your experience. Like part of you was in your body and then also part of you was out of your body. Do you feel like that's a possibility? I do, uh, mainly because of the fact that I returned to it. I feel like if that wasn't the case, I would have went on to whatever you know came next, but instead actually returned. So I felt like maybe there was a, a connection still between myself alive and myself in the afterlife. All right. Is there anything else that you saw that we haven't talked about during your experience? Um, so like I said, the colors were absolutely amazing. Um, I wish that I could describe them, but there, there truly are no words. Um, they were 
different colors than what we actually see, different greens than what we actually see. And this was our normal, you know, looking at grass and, you know, looking at my car and things like that, because you could see out the window. Um, I had thought my first initial reaction when this happened was that something had happened, like we had gotten bombed, like nuked, and it was that fast and it was that bright. Um, and then all of a sudden everything was fine. So in my mind, what I thought was, this was the afterlife. <laughs> this was it, you know, mm -hmm. and I was okay. And so that's what made everything okay. Um, again, it was completely silent, but the TV, that was the part that really amazed me is because at one point on the TV, there was a lot of yelling, there was a lot of protesting and things. And then all of a sudden it was like frozen and the people on the screen were also not moving. So it felt like I was out of time, mm. but still my heart beated. So I knew that I was in time. Very fascinating. That's the first time I've seen something like that where time appeared to stop on the outside world. Yeah, it was it was very intense, but it was what I needed um, to understand these messages, which is that we live in a very different world than what we're told. <laughs> How did you discover that you had a stroke? I actually didn't discover that till years later. Um, this is my second kind of NDE, um, so. After my initial NDE, I started receiving clarity and downloads. So I would wake up like as if you're having a dream and I would have all this knowledge about quantum mechanics and spirituality and the Bible. And so I started studying. I'd grab the Bible, I'd grab a book on quantum mechanics and I'd start following these downloads. And um, they led me to Tesla. So I received a download three years later that said that I was actually going to die at the age of 45. And I ignored it because I was like, I'm not going to pay attention to that. It continuously kept showing up. And so I started listening to it and I started asking myself the question, you know, what's so bad with that? You know, most people don't even know when they're going to, and here's a chance where I can live the greatest 20 years of my life. So I started accepting it, started working with the homeless, started getting involved with the local church and helping them. I started running bingo. I became a dog trainer. I did all these things because there was just no fear. You know, I knew everything was going to be okay. And um, so one day at church, I had actually collapsed. I had had pain um, in my ear and I had collapsed and they rushed me to the hospital. And the nurse uh, called the doctor and said, I have a feeling I really want to run um, a uh, CT scan you know, or an MRI. And so they did. And they found out that I actually had a brain aneurysm and I had had a mini stroke. And so once we knew that, then we knew that previously that's what happened as well um and so not only did that message save my life um in terms of that sent me on the journey to actually be able to reverse the brain aneurysm because i no longer have one and i did not have surgery because it was at a place where you couldn't have surgery so it sent me on a path to wanting to learn to heal and that's where nine vibes came from so I, i'm assuming what you're saying is that this ultimately led you to heal yourself yes Yes, it did. In the beginning, I mentioned that you started down a spiritual journey. What else did you study besides Christianity? <laughs> um, that's a lot. Um, the Golden Ratio, The Golden Angle, uh, Nikola Tesla's Three, Six, and Nine. Read a lot of his books. Jumped into Einstein's Theory of Relativity. Um, I studied a lot in the beginning of when we got into quantum mechanics. Uh, the funny thing is we think it's new. It's not new. <laughs> it's been out for, for a very long time. Obviously, in Einstein's time, when they were talking about atomic energy, they were working with quantum mechanics. Um, I also dove into Egyptian tuning. Um, I dove into the Bible. I started finding nines and information that was found in the Bible. The Kabbalah, the Zohar, the Kibbalah. <laughs> it kind of goes on and on. Um, I almost became... Uh, a machine. I just, any book I could get my hands on, I started reading and it made it easier because I was specifically looking for something. That's the best part is that once I understood what Tesla was talking about, about three, six, and nine, I understood I could read a book and I could find the information I was looking for and then move on to the next one. I didn't have to uh, retain all the information. So it made it a lot easier to learn things. Besides getting downloads, have you noticed that you have any other abilities after your NDE that you didn't have prior? No. And I don't actually think of my downloads as an ability. I think that everybody truly gets downloads at all times. I think that's what awareness is. Whenever you are in a situation and you go, huh, you know, I'm going to think about it this way. But I think that clarity is the part that was actually revealed to me. 
Whereas before I may have get, got downloads and I didn't understand them or wasn't paying attention. Now I was almost like um, I had a direct signal. So the clarity is what came through. And once I had the clarity, things like I was talking about aerokinetics um, isn't, a, isn't a skill. It isn't something or isn't an ability. It's not something that, you know, you're born with. It's something that you can learn once you understand the clarity of how to do it. So I felt like a lot of this information started just to become more clear to me. And so I started practicing it. Can you tell us more about nine vibes? Absolutely. So nine vibes is basically a central hub for all knowledge. So it doesn't matter if it's the Egyptian book of the dead or the Zohar or the Quran or a science book. The point of nine vibes is it's kind of like you take your information and you run it through a filter and you end up pulling out the things that align with nine. And the reason you can do this is because every single thing that you can see around you has a label. Every label has a word. Every word has a letter. Every letter has a number. And there's only nine options. So even if you have a number that's very large, let's say 25,920, you just add each of the individuals and you'll end up with a digital root of nine. So once you can do that, you can find nine in everything from nature to the cosmos um, to religion. And so that's what Nine Vibes does. It welcomes all paths, but we all are looking for the unity of nine. If you add any numbers together in succession, whatever the answer will be, will always be the square root of nine? Uh, no. So basically what it is, is there's only nine options for what the outcome is going to be if you're doing digital roots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. So in other words, um, if I were to take two plus two, all right, you end up with four. That's a digital root. But if I take eight plus eight, I end up with 16, but I still have two numbers. So one plus six is seven. That would be my digital root. So no matter how big the number gets, you keep adding it until you get only one singular digit. And since the number 10 has two digits, it can't actually be one of the nine. So you stop at nine and everything will fit within those categories. It's like if you had a box, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and every word and every number will fit into one of those boxes. I'm just trying to do the math in my head and trying to remember that. I've seen it before and I'd forgotten about it, but it's nice to kind of review that again. So if we have like six plus seven is 13 and then you end up with one plus three is four. Correct. And then, So four would be the digital root. Okay, digital root. Tell me that again. What is the digital root? Yeah, so a digital root is basically where you take any outcome of the answer to a math equation and you just keep adding it until you only have one digit left. So it, you can go all the way, let's say you have 22, 2 plus 2 then gives you 4, so the digital root is 4. So it doesn't matter how big the number is or how small the number is, you're only looking for 1 through 9. It'll only be 1 through 9. Oh, okay. I understand what you're saying now. Does each number one through nine have a significance? Kind of like, you know, the, uh, I, what is that? The Fibonacci sequence where the ones that are not divisible, one, three, seven, right. five. Yeah. It's actually amazing because um, when you split up the one through nine, you end up with that three, six, and nine that Tesla was talking about. So for instance, if you were to write out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and you drop out the three, six, and nine he's talking about, that leaves you with 12, 45, and 78. So if you add those up, you end up with three, six, and nine. So it's always hidden there. Nine is always there. If you were to add one through nine, you get a total of 45. Four plus five is nine. But if you take off the nine and you just add one through eight, you get 36 and three plus six is nine. So whether it's there and you see it or whether it's not there because you don't see it, it's still prevalent. Um, nine is still going to be there. So each one of these numbers, um, it's not that they represent something special. It's the fact that each one of them fit together to create that three, six and nine flow. And once you're living your life in a three, six or nine flow, then you're living aligned with nature. Because when you get down to the, mathematics of how nature was created, such as you were talking about the Fibonacci sequence. Um, that's basically just taking a number that came before to the present number and you get a new number and you keep doing that to infinity. It's, you know, the, the bunny sequence of just hopping and keep going to infinity. Um, or you're talking about Benford's law, which is a law that governs everything. Um, they used it in Enron 
whenever they were able to find out that they were changing their numbers because it didn't follow Benford's law. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. The highest you can actually go in a digital route is nine. So no matter what you're discussing, it will fit into one of those boxes. And that makes it easy to find patterns. How do we apply the theory or the, the science of nines to our lives and get benefit from it? So I love this question because you can do it in many ways. Um, there's something that's called a 369 calendar. So what you do is you take the date and you just add up all the numbers. So today is 10, 26, 2022. So if you were to add up the one plus two, you get three plus six is going to be nine plus two is going to be 11 plus two is going to be 13 plus two is going to be 15. So one plus five is six. So you just add them up all the way to you have a digital root. So on days three, six, or nine, you do what Tesla said. You align that and you try a little harder. You're a little more kind. You're a little more patient. You're a little more uh, understanding. And what will happen is if enough people would do this, you would see that we would start uniting in a way without ever changing our beliefs or our paths. One of the greatest things about numbers is they are unbiased. They don't care what you believe in. So we can link up in ways and universally and globally change things while still holding on to the things that we consider unique within us. What do you think about numerology? Numerology is um, fantastic. It's fun. I really enjoy it. Um, the Kibble line speaks of as above, so below. So whether you're talking about following the cosmos or whether you're talking about following just like birth dates, um, I have done some research to find out that on the day that you're born, you can link it to the star that was in the sky that gave more of the element um, that is in your body. So nitrogen, oxygen, uh, carbon, these are all directly linked to when you were born. And so you have more of it in your body than other people. There are many ways you can do numerology. And I think that um, one of the things that I stand on is that there's truth in all, but not all is truth. So it's up to us to find what really resonates for us. How do you apply nine vibes to the Bible? To the Bible. <clears throat> so this is one of my favorite things because I was raised in the church. So finding a way to actually link mathematics and science back to the, the church um, is good for me because I believe that it's about bridging things, not getting rid or burning things down. So for instance, that circle that you were talking about, um, the nine where you add the nine at the top and then one, two, three, four, five in terms of vortex math all the way to nine. If you were to put a triangle, an equilateral triangle and rotate it, you will actually reveal the seven chakra frequencies in unison if you rotate it around. And so in the Bible, you can actually go to Numbers chapter 12 verse, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter seven, representing your seven chakras or your seven candles, uh, verse 12. And as you continue going through that, it's going to reveal to you the seven chakra frequencies as well. So it's all directly connected. Um, you can look at Jesus's walk, right? So if you take Jesus, Jesus and Gematria is four, five, six, six, six. And four plus five plus six plus six plus six is 27. And two plus seven is nine. So whether you do it from a Hebrew side and follow the Kabbalah and the Zohar, or whether you do it from a Christian side, um, you're able to find nine in, in all the different books and all the different stories. Does nine vibes apply to the Merkaba? It does. Um, again, the as above, so below. So the one triangle is going to represent a certain amount of numbers that's going to add to nine. The bottom is going to be, so it's going to be one, four, seven at the top or one, seven, four, depending on how you view it and two, eight, five or two, five, eight at the bottom. And so that's going to be your six and top one's going to be your three. So put them together and you have a nine. At a point in your life, do you just start seeing these sequences and nines everywhere? Yes, you do. Um, <clears throat> at least you start to notice them. They've always been there because of the fact that when you really look at the amount of numbers that would be used to create this matrix that is the universe, again, once you reduce it down to the nine digital roots, you can find patterns much easier. You know, you can find the Fibonacci to the golden ratio much easier. Um, and so it makes it a lot easier to follow these things. For those people out there that don't know the golden ratio, can you explain them for us? Yeah. So all of nature is created using the golden ratio and that's all the way up to the cosmos, all the way down to the cells. And so um, it starts off as Fibonacci, which is 
the zero plus one ends up being one, one plus one ends up being two, two plus one ends up being three, two plus three is five. So what it does is it takes the number before and it adds it to the present number to create the next number. So when this continues going on, it gets closer and closer to what is called the golden ratio, 1.618. So it's like almost like it's trying to reach perfection, but it never actually gets there. So this is how nature actually designs. It uses Fibonacci. If you look at like a pine cone, you'll see the inside of the pine cone is very choppy. And then it becomes perfection as it starts to spiral out. Or if you look at a nautical shell, it's the same thing. It's very choppy in the beginning, and then it starts getting you know closer and closer to perfection. So the golden ratio is the level of perfection in nature. Aren't fractals uh, based on the Fibonacci or the golden ratio? Yeah, so fractals are definitely based off Fibonacci or also the golden ratio. Again, everything starts as the Fibonacci and goes into the golden ratio. Um, fractals are things you can find in crystals because of that's how they actually um, expand out. Whereas in nature, you don't actually find as much fractalization as you do in certain elements. So you were a Christian before your experience. How did this affect your faith in Christianity? It affected it greatly. <laughs> um, I was raised in the church where we were taught that you don't say things because you open doors. Um, I actually have a family member who was born with a disease that made it to where the church kind of told us that as long as we stay on the path, that person won't get sick or won't get worse. So we lived in a lot of fear. And um, for me personally, this was the most powerful experience that removed fear for the first time in my life. So since it removed that fear, did it change your view of Christianity in any way? It did. Um, it didn't change the view in terms of condemning it. It actually changed the view in terms of having compassion for it. Because what I realized is that if you actually knew this information, um, what Tesla was talking about, what Einstein's talking about, uh, Mozart knew it because he used it in his music. You know, if you actually lived this information, you wouldn't need the Bible and you wouldn't need the church. And so I understand how they use this because of the fact that um, they haven't figured it out. If they had figured it out, they would have been moving on with their own lives. And so I actually just felt more compassion for people who are still seeking this very specific path because there's there's so much more out there um and it's it's about getting off the yellow brick road you you have to trust in something greater than yourself and that's a very difficult thing to find in religion you mentioned that you practice aerokinetics what yes. is that so aerokinetics is basically um the understanding that all around us is quantum energy and quantum energy only has one option or well, two options it's to be seen or not be seen that's the most amazing thing about quantum computers the moment that we observe a quantum computer it's now officially a paperweight so it can choose to be seen or not be seen um, the double slit experiment also proved that so when you're working with aerokinetics what you're doing is you are learning to have a relationship and a bond with the energy you cannot see around you the same way you would with like a dog and once you establish that bond, then that makes manifestation and doing things like that much easier because all you're doing is giving what you cannot see the option to actually be seen. So when you're doing aerokinetics, what you're learning to do is you're learning to move and interact with unseen energy, such as um, the wind to move your pinwheel. And so the better that you get at it, the more you stop it, you you know do it on certain cue, just like you would training, training a dog. Um, and so it's just energy work. And so whether you're doing it in aerokinetics, which just means wind, um, or whether you're doing it hydrokinetics, which is water, um, you can also do pyrokinetics, which is obviously fire. So it's about tapping into the sentient energy that is in our elements. Since you use the word kinetics, is it about moving the energy? It is. It's about collaborating with the energy. So a lot of times when people hear that, they think control. But it's about the bond, the same way it is, like I said, with an animal. You don't control the animal, you collaborate. And so, yes, it's about collaborating and being able to move and shift energy. So when aerokinetics, are you outside in nature? Perhaps you're able to feel wind or breezes and, as you say, collaborate with them and move the energy? Yes. So everything starts out in nature um, because that's where the relationship needs to be established. And so you can actually borrow energy from trees. You can borrow energy from the sun. Um, so the more bonds that you build with nature, the more energy you will be able to work with. And at first, it starts off where you feel 
like, you know, the wind just came or things like that. But then what you do is you train and you learn how to stop it and you learn how to, you know, reverse, you know, your pinwheel and things like that. And once you establish that belief, um, then you can do it in your house because the, the problem is in your house, it's very dense energy. If you walk into your house and you're negative, that stays for a very long time, whereas nature kind of cycles through a lot faster. When you yeah. collaborate with your energy, like in a dense place, like with your house, are you trying to change the energy from negative to positive or, or do other things? So in um, <clears throat> following nine vibes, you wouldn't actually be able to change the energy. You can change yourself. And if you changed yourself, then you would radiate positive energy and that would transform because the more energy um, that you give out, the more it's going to filter out the negative energy. Um, it's kind of like if you have a cup and it's got dirt in it, if you keep pouring in fresh water, sooner or later that dirt is going to flow out of the cup. So um, that would be a lot of work though. That's one of the reasons why I start my students outside is um, I just finished teaching a class on this. And so everybody was outside, they're working on their pinwheels and uh, you have to learn the laws of how the earth works, why it rotates the way it does, um, how to establish these bonds before you know you can actually just jump in. Um, but I always start people outside because of that, that cycling. Nature cycles through positive energy much faster than we do. Have you ever thought about your experience and how the energy was during that experience, everything was bright and colors that you you know you can't explain and compare that to the work you're doing now. Yes, I I believe that what I experienced was a world where the um, ambient energy, the the quantum energy that I'm talking about, was flowing freely. That's why I was in time and not in time. It was like time had a choice whether or not it wanted to even be there. Light had a choice how it wanted to actually shine and reflect. Um, you know, we're taught in science that you know, the sun shines rays, the object absorbs all the ones it wants to, and then leaves the color that it wants on the top surface to basically, you know, be seen by our eye. But when you get into the Kabbalah, it teaches you that there's a lot more to that, that there's a choice that's involved in that. And then there's an observer, which is why you see what you want to see. Um, and so I feel like in that situation that I was in, it was like watching little fairies light up, but simultaneously. So that's why I saw things different than what I did. A lot of near-death experiencers will say that the reality on the other side is more real than being here in 3D realm. Was that the same for you? Um, actually, no, um, it, it was not the same for me. In fact, I think the reason that I came back is because of the understanding that, um, I, I live by this quote that says that by yourself, <clears throat> you are everything, but without another, you are no thing. And it doesn't mean nothing, which, you know, usually means something negative. It means that there's nothing to compare that you're actually something, right? If I'm the only person that exists in this world, who would tell me that I was handsome? Who would tell me that I was kind? Because there's nobody that you know I can be kind to. Um, so in that situation, I think that what it showed me is that what comes next is okay, that you're safe, that um, it's not to be feared. Because one of the things that religion does teach you to do is it teaches you to be on edge at all times. Because obviously, if it's your last moment, you want to make sure that you're aligned um, and that you have you know your ducks in a row. And so for me personally, it removed all of that fear for me. And because it removed all of that fear, I was able to just trust it and step into it. Do you fear death at all? I do not. Um, I do not fear death at all. I don't fear how you can die because I know that in that moment, your brain gets flooded with so much that you don't experience that moment. So what people see on the outside can look terrifying and it can look scary. But what is actually happening on the inside is the most kind, compassionate way that you could transition from this life to the afterlife. Are you saying that like if you see somebody dying and they're in pain and agony, that they're not really experiencing that? They're already on the other side. It would depend on the situation. Obviously, if you're in pain and agony and you're not at the end of your life, um, pain and agony is what keeps you alive. But there is a specific point where you do actually, the, the left brain just slows down and it slows down. And when that happens, lunar time, um, cognitive thinking, your ego, all the things that exist on the left brain, because your left brain is about taking the big picture and breaking it down into parts you can understand. 
that starts going back over to the right side. That energy starts going back over the right side. And once it does, you just feel peace. You feel aligned, you feel unity. And so, yes, you'll see this a lot in the end times for people where they're talking to people, they're closing doors, they're wrapping things up because they're safe. They can do it in this. They can talk to that person that abused them, or they can have a discussion with the person who hurt them because they know that they're safe in that environment. It's quite common for a near-death experiencer who has been involved in something very traumatic, like hit by a car or you know something like that, that they actually pop out of their body before that assault on it happens. So right. they don't actually even experience that. How would you explain right. that? I would say it's the exact same thing. I think that what is happening is when you say pop out of your body, there's no actual science to show the, the pop out of the body, right. but there is science to show that that left brain can't handle what's happening in the situation. And since time doesn't exist, you could be in that one second that that truck hits for seven years, you know, time doesn't exist the moment that that left brain shuts down because your left brain is the only thing that holds time. So if you're on your right side, then yeah, you would be, you would feel like you were popped out of your body and you were safe. It's interesting. I'm not debating you. I just never heard before that your left brain is the one that's, that holds time, as you said. Yeah. Your right brain. Um, there's actually a, a TED talk um, uh, by Jill oh, Bowden, I believe is her name. Um, and she talks about how she had a stroke as well. Um, and she talks about the experience she had when she's a, a brain uh, surgeon. So <laughs> imagine, you know, the shock when she's going, you know, I'm actually having a stroke mm -hmm. and there's nothing I can do. So she talks about the fact that she would look at cards and you can't read anything because that's all done through your left brain. And so she's looking at her own business card to try to call into work and she can't put any of it together because all of that is done through the left side of your brain. That is fascinating because they talk about, you know, right brain is creativity and right and left brain is more analytical thought. Right. Mathematical. Yeah. Definitely and I guess analytical, time is egoic. A lot of words they use. Your left brain shuts down at death and then you're left with your right brain, which is I guess not only creativity, but spirituality. Yeah. And for those that don't like the word uh, spirituality, it's unity. It's the moment that you realize that you're all one, that everything's okay. It's kind of like, I imagine it in the way of like when you would take off a VR headset, you know, no matter how intense it gets, you know that you are completely okay once you take it off. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's kind of the exact same way. And I don't want to tie life into a game because we are here for a very specific reason. Um, but it is kind of like that where you know everything is going to be all right. I love that you mentioned the VR headset because my son has one and I was in that world for a <laughs> while. And what was fascinating is when I took it off, and I think it was after the very first time that I used it, it's almost maybe like having a near-death experience. I was like, oh, I'm back here. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, imagine when they get it really good and then you're like, oh, man, <laughs> I'm back here. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, so if people want to find out more about your nine vibes aligned information, how do they find it? Yeah, so they can actually go to uh, ninevibesuniversal.com. So it's a nine as the number and then vibesuniversal.com. Um, I also have a YouTube uh, channel as well as a Facebook. Um, I have an ebook that has 26 chapters, including my healing journey. So you can learn how I did it. Um, and, and kind of follow that story. You can find that on the website as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of trying to be as many places as I can because I just love sharing knowledge. Um, and Nine Vibes welcomes all paths. There's not a single person, a single path that is not welcomed. The only guide to Nine Vibes is just being kind. And you can find that in any walk. Your ebook is called Nine Vibes Using Nine as a Cipher. Do they find that Correct. on your website or Amazon? Um, you can find it on both. You can find it on the website and on Amazon.com. All your other social media places named Your Nine Vibes or Nine Vibes That's Aligned? Correct. Nine Vibes Universal. If you type that in, you'll find everything. What do you think inspires you about your near-death experience? Well, losing fear. Losing fear is a game changer. Um, we don't realize how much fear that we have in our lives, and we don't realize how much fear takes from us. Um, I tell people often that you live and die by fear. Um, and so until you learn to rise above that, it, it's going to be the thing that determines, you know, your misery, your joy, you know, depending on where you're at. Um, 
what inspires me actually is other people, the people who came before. Um, you know, when you learn about Einstein, Mozart, Tesla, these are all people who thought outside the box. They did not stay on the path. That's the whole entire point. They called Einstein and laughed at him calling, you know, his stuff uh, false science, you know, and he comes up with the theory of relativity. Um, so I'm very inspired by people who are willing to expand past the bounds that we're supposed to stay within, because those seem to be the people that really change things. And um, so for me personally, I think that a lot of these downloads are going to come to a clarity or an answer that's really going to help people. It's, it's going to change things, mainly because for the first time ever, we're exploring the possibility of using morality to create technology. Because if three, six, and nine are aligned with positive and uh, positive vibrations, positive frequencies, we could actually create a technology that was based off of something positive and moral versus just arbitrary. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe I, I train, I have classes, uh, I have mentorships, and I have breakthrough sessions. I believe in bonds. Uh, with people. I don't want to be somebody who isn't reaching out or communicating with people. So yes, you can absolutely send me a message. What's the best way to do that? You can do it at uh, ninevibesuniversal at gmail.com, or you can send me a message on Facebook. Uh, you could just send me a message. Almost all of them come through. All right. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you would like people to know about? Currently, I am working on a class on cryptocurrency. I had some people who came to me and really wanted some help understanding it. And I was able to find some nine vibes alignments, such as Bitcoin itself is a digital root of nine. Um, I studied WD GAN uh, for almost a year. And so I'm going to be sharing some of those patterns and how he was able to predict the market. Um, as I said, I do training classes. I have beginner classes, advanced um, and self-mastery. Um, but Mainly what I'm working on outside of all that is I'm working on the Seder Square and working on trying to show how the Seder Square actually not manipulates, but can collaborate with fusion. And this is directly going to link to Oppenheimer and Einstein, obviously, uh, during World War II, they were working on this before the war actually happened. And so I'm kind of trying to put some of those things together um, using nine as well as the cipher. Did you have any after effects after your NDE? I did. Uh, so other than the downloads that I talked about, I actually started seeing the flower of life as if it was um, like a contact lens in my eye. So I would see it, I would see like a light and then I would see all the different vesica Pisces that would make up a flower of life. And the really interesting thing is I didn't know what a flower of life was. So I couldn't figure out what it was that I was seeing. And when I started studying three, six, and nine, I started learning about the flower of life. Then I learned about the platonic solids. Um, and so I started then really focusing on sacred geometry. What is the flower of life? The flower of life is a universal symbol that you can find in all different religions and all different cultures. It's the understanding of, so at first you have a seed of life, which is seven circles that are overlapping to create six Vesica Pisces. Vesica Pisces is just if you were to take two circles and overlap them, there's a space that is now created between the two, and that is called the Vesica Pisces. So if you were to continue expanding out um, by 60 circles, you end up with a flower of life. And um, within that is every point that you could to create sacred geometry. So you can have the um, tetrahedron, isosahedron, octahedron, dodectrahedron, and cube all within the flower of life. You also have the um, Metatron's cube that's found within the flower of life. So it's the understanding of the curve and the line that come together to create our universe. It's fascinating because just yesterday I was reading about Metatron's cube, but it's nice to hear that the synchronicity is there that it pops up again. Yeah, Metatron's cube is amazing. Um, there's so much knowledge that is involved in that, especially when you apply the Fibonacci sequence to it. So if you were to put the numbers to it, there are very specific points that it hits in Metatron's cube that end up giving you those 13 circles that actually create Metatron's cube. All right. Well, before we finish up, can you give us one last positive message? There is truth in all, but not all is truth. So no matter what path you're on, no matter what book you're reading, no matter what TV show or movie, you can find the truth. And the truth is going to be unconditional love. 
You can find it in every story. Um, even if you take something like the matrix, you can watch it from the side of Neo and you can follow it and you can understand the unconditional love for his friends and everything, just as you can watch it from Mr. Smith, who just wanted a different option. He felt trapped. And so you can find that in everything that you're looking at. And that's what Nine Vibes is. It allows you to go into some of the dark places that you wouldn't go in your life with a flashlight for the first time. Devin, thank you for that message. And thank you again for being my guest. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.